If I just had a little bit of a technical difficulty with my Wi-Fi because of load shedding, but we are back in action for today's live lesson. Um, I'm just going to wait for a couple of people to join still. Of course, if you have to leave the live at any point, you can because this will be recorded. Um, and I will then be posting this up uh, when we're done. This will be our last live before paper one. I'm just going to quickly clean the camera because she's a little blurry. There we go. Let's make a focus on that. There we go. <clears throat> I am going to be doing all of your requests in the comment section. So we're going to be doing some female reproduction, some male reproduction. We're going to be doing some um, plant hormones and phototropism. Uh, we are going to be doing some homeostasis questions. Those are all questions that were requested by everybody. Um, as I saw in the comments section. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start because um, I don't want to uh, waylay the process anymore. And I'm going to first cover actually not a question, but um, if you've watched my prediction video, everybody, um, you would have seen that I mentioned to you that there's a potential question maybe this year that they're going to ask you about uh, molecular cloning. And I can't remember the member's name, but there was a query about whether or not I could explain what molecular cloning is. Um, and in case <clears throat> you also don't know, this would be great for you. I really struggled to actually find a question, a past paper question that did molecular cloning. But I know one exists because I distinctly, distinctly remember it being asked um, in the last, I want to say... Uh, five to six years. I just couldn't find the question that I wanted to show you guys. But essentially, this is what I want to do. Um, I'm going to explain molecular cloning for you first, okay? So, um, no, cloning is not out of the syllabus, everybody. Just to answer your question, I can see you in the chat as well. So, no, cloning is not out of the syllabus. Cloning is still in the syllabus. It's in the second paper. It's in paper two. But I just wanted to clarify this um for anybody who doesn't know what molecular cloning is, okay? So, <clears throat> first things first, um, molecular cloning is quite straightforward. What you end up having is they take bacterial cells, okay, there's my little bacteria, little tail, and inside bacteria, they have something called a plasmid, which is what this is. And it is a ring of DNA. And basically what we do is we take the plasmid out of the bacteria. So it's now separate like that. And then what we do is we take a piece of DNA. So that's what this is over here. So this is a little, little section of DNA. And generally, this little section of DNA is going to produce something like insulin. So it's all the genes that create insulin. Then what we do is we take this plasmid and we cut out a piece like that. And we cut it with what we call restriction enzymes, right? And then we take that piece of human DNA and we insert it in to the plasmid like that. Once it's been inserted into the plasmid, the plasmid gets put back into the original bacteria that it came from, like that. And it goes off and it reproduces. And essentially, once it reproduces, um, it's going to copy this DNA. Now, why is that important? And why do we do this? We do this so that we can make many, 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 many insulin gene copies so that we can make insulin. So essentially, what happens is every time this bacterial cell reads this DNA over here, this human inserted piece of DNA, it reads it and it goes, oh, okay, I need to make insulin. Now, I know you're probably thinking, just to clarify, um, no, animals and plants that we use to manipulate th like this, they don't know that insulin is not a part of their genetic makeup. Remember, DNA is written in the same four letters, uh, A, G, T, 
and C. So bacteria can't tell the difference. It just reads the information and out comes insulin. And literally it secretes it. So it's like an actual liquid that comes out of the bacteria. Now, this is, of course, just one bacterium. If they reproduce, what you end up having is many, many, many bacteria that now have this, uh, let me just color it in for you, that now have this inserted gene. Okay, just put it at the bottom here. And every time they replicate, they pass on this newly inserted gene, which then increases the frequency, which means they make more and more insulin. And that's essentially how we actually make modern day insulin today. We used to take it from horses, but now that's just not a feasible option. And also it's really difficult to get the amount that we need. So we just rely on bacteria. Specifically, we use E. coli. Now, what are some of the questions that they like to ask with this? Um, I'm just going to erase some of this. So the questions they like to ask linked to this are things like, um, why bacteria? Why do we use bacteria? Well, number one, they uh, rapidly reproduce, right? Um, and that's a great benefit because it means that they are able to <clears throat> produce large quantities and pass on the inserted gene without humans doing it again and again for them. So in other words, we just have to do it once. And then once we've done it to one bacteria, it will continue to reproduce and make more of itself with the inserted gene. Another reason why we use bacteria is because of its plasmid. It is the only organism that has this little extra cellular piece of um, DNA, or should I not say cellular, extra nuclear. That's what we call it. We call it extra nuclear. And basically, it means it's outside of the nucleus. And that's very beneficial because it's easy to access. So plasmid equals easy access. Okay, um, <clears throat> and uh, there are a couple of other reasons that are a little bit more advanced that we don't really need to know. Um, and that's basically it when it comes down to molecular cloning. So if they ask you any kind of question like this in paper two, that's essentially what they're going to ask you. Um, and they're going to ask you to explain the situation. They may even ask you to like draw the bacteria at the end. If you had to draw it, these are the labels that I would suggest. Obviously, um, we need to label this as a bacteria. But let me draw the final, the final product. When you do draw a bacterium that is changed molecularly, which means you've changed its DNA, so we've added that, what you will maybe need to do is just indicate that with a little line like this, that that is the new section of DNA. And now you can't call it a plasmid anymore because you've changed it. We're going to say that this is a recombinant plasmid. And then everything else is the same. Like this is a bacteria. This is a flagella. Um, this is the rest um, of the plasmid. But remember that the whole thing is the recombinant. So we're going to label that whole thing. And um, this was the plasmid. Now we call it a recombinant plasmid. Um, and then, of course, you can also label, you know, like the cell wall and the cell membrane, that kind of thing, if you were labeling this in the exam. I'm just going to take a quick pause and look at your chat before I move on to the first question. All right, wonderful wise. Ma'am, if you have time, can you please do the September 2015, 2.2, 2.4, or you know, another because we write paper one. Um, so, uh, wonderful wise, I don't mind doing that. It is quite an old paper that you're doing as well. I, I will say that. Um, and just to keep in mind when you are doing practice papers, you can do any year you like. But I just want to inform you that over the years, examiners change. Um, and they change roughly every three to four years, um, which means that when you start to do very, very old papers, you're doing very, very old um, examiner papers, which means that the style of question has often changed at that point. Um, so that's why sometimes the best focus is within these last few years. So if I was you, I would be practicing 2020, uh, 2020, 2020, 2019, maybe even 2018. You could do 2020 as well, but remember everything in the paper from 2020 is not going to be in this paper, just as a, a guide to sort of get the, you through your practice. Um, and let me just have a look at something else. Um, 
Singita Faith, uh, can I do a little bit of mRNA and tRNA? I'm going to do that in our paper two revision on Saturday, and that link is going to come out soon. So if you're wondering when we're going to do paper two, we're going to do it on Saturday, everybody. Uh, and the same for if you want to see things on base triplets versus codons and anticodons, I'm going to do that all on Sunday. Uh, no, cloning uh, is, Mohammed, cloning is not in paper one, it's in paper two. Um, if I remember correctly, um, and the query came from somebody commenting on the paper two prediction that I put out for you guys, for you members yesterday or the day before, um, that video is going to go live for the public tomorrow. Um, so that's where the, the question came in. So no, there's no cloning in paper one, but I just wanted to get it out of the way for those of you who have now watched the video and you're thinking, how do I do this molecular cloning that I mentioned in the prediction video. Now I've shown it to you. Okay, right. So I'm going to move on to the first requested topic for today, which was looking at um, these sort of application human reproduction questions on the male and female reproductive systems. I like this one because I've seen it quite a few times before, and it's a great way to apply knowledge. Um, and sometimes uh, the reason why they can ask so many of these in an exam sometimes, they can ask two or three, is they're asking this in the endocrine section instead of the, the reproduction section. Because if you actually remember the ovaries, the pituitary gland, that's all part of the endocrine system. So there's a bit of an overlap there too. But let's get through into the picture. Uh, let's get into the question. So it says utopic pregnancies. A utopic pregnancy is a problem in which the embryo attaches outside of the uterus. And in most cases, the embryo implants in the fallopian tubes, which remember, we don't want that. But implantation can also occur in the actual ovary, uh, in the cervix or in the abdominal cavity. A utopic pregnancy cannot proceed normally. The embryo usually cannot survive. Utopic pregnancies are caused by one or more of the following. Uh, an infection or inflammation of the fallopian tubes, development of scar tissue from previous infection, or previous surgery. In most cases, the fallopian tubes, where there is a utopic pregnancy occurs, has to be removed surgically to save the woman's life. And they've actually very kindly given you a diagram to sort of envision this so you can see how this works. If you've done the Eastern Cape mock exam, they actually had a very similar question to this one as well this year. Um asking about utopic pregnancies. So this is what a utopic pregnancy would look like. And as we should already know, this is not where the fetus should be developing. It should be developing down here. Um, and before we even get into it, I always tell you to spend some time labeling everything so that you are very comfortable in what you are looking at. So first things first, if we just zoom in on this diagram, let's put some labels on here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we need to be able to tell the difference between A and B. And um, you'll notice there's no ovary in this picture, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, a is what we call the infundibulum. Okay, it's the beginning bit uh, of the fallopian tube. And then B is the fallopian tube. So I'm just going to put F fallopian, FT for fallopian tube. Um, this is pointing to the uterus. E is pointing to the cervix. I know it's the cervix, by the way, because it is the entrance into the uterus. And this area down here is the vagina. Let's not confuse. Let's not confuse uterus, cervix, and vagina. They're not the same thing. Okay, now that we have labeled that, we can now answer the questions a little bit better and we know what to look for. So number one says, give only only the letters of the two parts of the diagram where implantation of the embryo may occur during a utopic pregnancy. So as they said, you need to provide um, the label, uh, sorry, the letter of the two parts that it could uh, form in. So the letter number or letter B is going to be our first choice as we can already see it in the picture right? Now, if we're not so certain, we go back up to the paragraph and it says implantation can occur in the ovaries, cervix, or abdominal cavity. Now, very important here, everybody. There is no ovaries here. Do you see how they're trying to catch you out? You just look at A and go, oh, boom, A um, must be the ovary. There's no ovary there, everybody. 
There's also no cavity label either. So the only other option, if we go back up to the paragraph, is the cervix, which is letter E. And to answer your question, Mohammed asked in the chat, um, could you write uh, fimbre? I think, yeah. Yes, you can. These are also called fimbre. All right, let's uh, move on to our next question. It says, explain... Remember, that's our words can tell us what we're going to do. Explain why women who have had surgery on their fallopian tubes have a greater risk of experiencing a utopic pregnancy. Now, don't panic when you read this kind of question and you think, I don't know enough to answer this. You do. And the paragraph is there to help you. So, remember to keep in mind, if it's an explain question, what do you need to do? You always need to have a statement and because this is out of three, you need to give two reasons. Okay, so how do you formulate the statement? So let's go in here and say, why women who have surgery on their fallopian tubes have a greater risk of experiencing a utopic pregnancy? So <clears throat> if we go back up to the paragraph to help us write the statement, it says utopic pregnancies can be caused by one of the following things. Infection development of scar tissue from a surgical procedure or previous surgery in the actual pelvis. So why is it that women who have surgery on their fallopian tubes have a greater risk of developing a utopic pregnancy? So statement, you must explain to me what about the surgery is causing the blockage or the utopic pregnancy. So that's going to be our statement. So first things first, it says, uh, who have had surgery? If you have surgery, they develop scar tissue. So that's going to be our statement. So our statement is about scar tissue. So women who have had surgical procedures may have scar tissue. Tick, right? That's our statement. Now, tell me why that scar tissue leads to utopic pregnancies. Well, let's think about it, everybody. Scar tissue is tissue that is fibrous, that doesn't belong there, and that often has no function other than to hold your body together when it's damaged. So I want you to imagine if there is scar tissue over here, right? How would that, the two reasons why scar tissue would lead to a utopic pregnancy? Well, the first thing, let's talk about it logistically. Can the fetus or the embryo leave the fallopian tube if there is a thick band of scar tissue? The answer, no. So first things first, we'll link it to the fact that the embryo can't leave the fallopian tube, right? Now, if the embryo can't leave the fallopian tube, it is then going to, it's reasoning, we're going to implant into the fallopian tube or into the ovary. Of course, there's no ovary in this picture, but as the paragraph suggested, that is what is happening. And so that is why women are at a greater risk of experiencing utopic pregnancies. It's all because when you have surgery, there will be a scar, some scar tissue. That scar tissue prevents the embryo from leaving the fallopian tube, which then means it will implant into the fallopian tube itself or potentially into the ovary. Okay, I'm going to have a look at a question because I'm pretty sure somebody asked a question. I'm just going to check. No, okay, fine. Right, let's move on. So question number three. Explain, again, there is our explain, why a woman who had her fallopian tubes removed after her utopic pregnancy occurred may still be able to fall pregnant. Okay, now <clears throat> I want you to read that question again really carefully, okay? And I want to highlight a key word here that you mustn't overlook. Explain why a woman who had her fallopian tube removed after a, an utopic pregnancy occurred may still be able to fall pregnant. Okay, these are one of those sneaky little questions that they put in that really throw us and they're trying to confuse you. Everybody, they're only talking about one tube. If we go back to the anatomy of the female body, we have two fallopian tubes. 
which means even if they remove the one, you still have the other. And that is literally what you're going to say. Remember, it's an explain question. So statement, reason. How do you formulate your statement? Your statement is telling me how or what is happening, right? So you're going to tell the marker, if I remove the fallopian tube, there is a second tube, right? So statement. Uh, second tube present, right? So that's our statement. So even if you remove one tube, there is a second fallopian tube present. Tick. Reasoning. Well, if there is a second tube present, then the ovary will still release an egg or an ovum. Therefore, pregnancy can still occur. Okay, maybe you want to say pregnancy will occur every other month, um, potentially. But I think once you've had one of your fallopian tubes removed and one of your ovaries removed as well, then just the one ovary works. Uh, if you didn't know this, and this is extra information, but your ovaries take turns. So in other words, one month it's the one ovary, the next month it's the other ovary. Okay, and that's it for that one. It's a short one. Last question. Give two reasons why the embryo may not be able to survive during a utopic pregnancy inside the fallopian tube. Okay, so first things first, the most obvious reason I'm hoping you're all thinking is space, right? There is not a lot of space here. So first of all, we're going to put here space. Another reason I want you to think about is the fallopian tube is not lined in the same way that the uterus is. So, yes, your endometrium does extend. However, it stops about here-ish. If you have endometrium growing elsewhere, you have something called endometriosis, which means it's endometrium that's growing where it shouldn't be. So there is no endometrium in the fallopian tubes. So that's the next problem, right? There is no endometrium. Now, why is that a problem? Because then there will be no placenta. Or if there is a placenta, it will be so underdeveloped that the baby won't get enough nutrition. So that is clearly two very simple reasons why this pregnancy wouldn't work. The one being very obvious, space. There's no space. The fallopian tubes are not flexible. They cannot stretch. And number two, there is no endometrium or there's not enough endometrium to provide a place for implantation, which means there is not enough place for placenta to grow either. Okay. Any questions on this particular topic? You're more than welcome to ask this. And this is, by the way, I chose this question because this is what I foresee in the final. That's why I chose all of these questions today, because they overlap really well with my prediction video and what I expect to see. Okay. Whilst you're thinking, I'm just going to swipe over to the next question so you can have a look at it while we wait. This next one is also on human reproduction, but again, this was a requested topic in the comment section by the members wanting to see a male uh, reproduction question on fertility and vasectomies and contraception and that kind of thing. So that's why I also chose this question because again, we may see this on Friday and I want to get you as prepared as possible. Now, if there isn't any questions for now on this topic, I'm going to move on. Otherwise, just leave them in the chat and I'm going to get to them at the end. Okay, so next question. The diagram below reps represents some part of the male reproductive system that is important just in case maybe you are not familiar with what you're looking at. Again, what do we always do? We take some time to label it. Yes, I know you can already see the next question is going to ask it, but trust me, <clears throat> If you label things first, before you answer the question, you are less likely to make a mistake at the end of the year in these finals on Friday. So what is A? It's going to be our testy. Uh, testy. I think I've spelled that wrong, actually. Test, testy. Yeah, testy. And then we have the B, which is this area over here, which is the ep 
epididymis. And then C is the scrotum. And they've already given us the vast deference label. Okay. So already identify parts A, B, and C. We've already done that. So check. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So not to waste any time. <clears throat> it says, describe the process of spermatogenesis in part A for four marks. So remember, describe is how, when, where, why, etc. So it's quite a long one. So I'm going to go over to a blank page. Remember, when we do descriptions, we're going to say things like how, where, when, why. And in this case, we are describing spermatogenesis, right? So how is all about taking a diploid cell. It undergoes meiosis, right? And it produces uh, a haploid cell. Now, the haploid cell is actually the Y, so we're going to put that down here just so you can see my thinking. So that's why we do this process. We have a haploid cell. Where does it take place? This takes place in the testes. And when does it take place after or slash from? Let's actually, let's not say after. Let's say, rather, let's say from... Puberty. And that's literally going to get you pretty much four marks. So you're going to tell me how it happens, where it happens, when it happens, and then why. Why is like, why do we go through spermatogenesis to make a haploid cell? Where is spermatogenesis taking place? In the testes. When does it happen? From puberty. And how does it occur? It happens when you take a diploid cell it undergoes meiosis and it forms a haploid cell. And that's really it, hey? Four marks, easy. In the bank on that one. Okay, <clears throat> let's move on to the next question. It says, test results show that a man that has a low, has a low sperm count. So that's our statement. Explain, okay, that's our question word, why a doctor would advise the man to, to wear underwear that is not tight for three marks. So remember, we need a statement and two reasons because it's for three marks. So let's go back onto this page. Statement, reason, reason. So how do you formulate the statement? The statement is about the underwear. So what about the underwear are we trying to explain? And then we're going to give reasons for making that statement. So we are saying he must not wear tight underwear. Why? Okay, reason. So that's how we're going to link it all together. So our statement is wearing tight underwear holds testes close to body. Okay, that's our statement. If you think about it, because, you know, if, if the fabric of, of, of the underwear is, is, is like very stretchy and tight, it can pull the testes closer to the body. Now, that is our statement. But what about our reasoning for why we made that statement? So if you wear tight underwear, it holds the testes close to the body. Then, okay, so these are our reasons. Then, number one. the temperature increases. And if the temperature increases, less sperm is produced. Why? Because sperm, we can say here denatures, or you could say like sperm is made at a lower temperature than body temperature.
Okay, so that's basically our reasoning. So wearing tight underwear holds the testes too close to the body. That increases the temperature of the testes, which means less sperm is produced. And less sperm is produced because sperm is denaturing, because sperm is made at a lower temperature than body temperature. Okay, and that's how you get three out of three for that one. Now, last question before I have a look at the comments. Uh, it says, during a vasectomy, the vast difference for both testes is cut. Explain one reason why a man who. And so you'll see it's out of two marks for each of these, which means that you need to make a statement with a reason for each of these. Okay. First of all is, explain one reason why a man who does not want to have children will choose to have a vasectomy. Okay. So if you don't want children, let's get rid of this, but just keep my statements and reasons. Why would you cut the vasectomy? So statement, it's all about the cut, reasoning what the cut produces, right? So statement. I'm going to say cutting the vas deference prevents sperm from traveling out of testes and therefore reason so you could even say therefore sperm cannot reach ovum. And that's it. Okay. The next question says, now explain one reason why a man who has a vasectomy is still capable of ejaculation for two reasons. Okay. Hopefully we know this already, but um, all of the secretions that make up semen, all the secretions from the prostate, from the carpus gland, from the seminal vesicle, everybody, that's after you make the cut. In other words, the cut is much lower down, and that means you still make all of the secretions. So remember, statement and reason. So let's link it all together. So uh, ejaculation still takes place because... Um, Semen is made up of secretions, reason, now, linked to this. Um, and so semen is made up of secretions and the vas deferens is cut before these secretions are added to semen. Because remember, semen is made up of sperm and the secretions, and together they make semen. And that's how we answer that one, okay? Not too bad. This is, again, very, very typical of what they're asking. All right, let's have a quick look at the chat. Did anybody ask anything? Let me have a look. Yes. Ma'am, how do we know which question requires a statement and reasoning versus definition and reasoning if they do not specify? Okay, great question. Um, so they will literally say, define, um, def what can we define now in paper one? Let's make it something realistic. Um Define, uh, what can we do in the in paper one that we would define? Let me just quickly think now of an example. Um, in paper one, they would probably ask you to, like something like, define astigmatism. Okay? That doesn't need a statement or a reason, everybody. So define literally means it has a definition. And more than likely, the definition should be taken out of your exam guideline. It should be there. If it's not, then, of course, you can use the one that is in your textbook. 
But define literally means make a definition about this thing. Tell me what it is. When it comes to statement and reason, that's always what you're doing for explain. So if it's an explain question for three marks, you always give a statement with two reasons. If it's an explain question for two marks, it's one statement, one reason. If it's an explain question for four marks, one statement, three reasons. Just be very, very careful that if it says explain and then like imagine the word two was here. So explain two ways, blah, blah, blah. Okay. If it says explain two ways and the mark allocation is for four, it means you need to give one statement and one reason for one way and then another statement and reason for the other. So it's like two marks plus two marks and those two marks is uh, one reason and one statement and then again one reason and one statement and that's how you should be breaking up all of your exam questions. Okay, uh, same for describe as I did earlier. If we just go, I think back, was it forward a page? Yeah, this is the four things that you would say. So describe always has how, where, when, and why. Always. Okay, <clears throat> let's move on to the next requested topic so we can get through all of them. There's a few more I want to do. This one was about our um, phototropism and plant hormones. I think we also dread this one too. We're nervous about what they're going to ask. Um, this one I liked for a couple of different reasons because it's not just the classic um, question about light. There is a, a little bit of a sneaky question that's in here. Um, we are, don't worry, wonderful wise, there is an LH and FSH question that's coming in today. So don't worry, it's near, It's going to be probably, if I show it to you, it's going to be this, this question here. We're going to get to it. So it's two questions away. All right. So question three, an investigation, oops, an investigation was carried out. And we're always going to highlight this opening sentence over here because what is this, everybody? It's your aim. And it's going to tell you your independent and dependent variables. So was carried out to determine the effect of auxins on the growth of coleoptiles. If you've never seen that word before, that word there, coleoptiles, uh, essentially, what they are are these um, growing sort of uh, stems that are coming out when we first grow a plant. That's what you're looking at, okay? This is actually a very, very common question, may I add, as well. So prepare yourself for this, okay? So that's what they're talking about, this structure here. And they say they did the following procedure. Um, they said that the tip of one uh, coleoptile, which is a young shoot, was removed and placed on a block of agar as shown in diagram. So there. What is agar? In case you don't know what it is, it is jelly um, made out of seaweed. But that's not too important. What is important is you need to know the properties of agar. And if you don't know what the properties of agar are, I'm just going to write it up here. But um, agar is um, it's very similar to like a membrane. So it has membrane qualities to it. It also, because it has membrane qualities to it, it also allows for diffusion really, really well. So you've got to keep that in mind and you'll see why it's going to be important for later on in the question. So we've got, uh, as uh, we mentioned over here, we removed it. Oh, let's actually highlight it. Not so we can see through. So we removed it and we replaced it. Let's go a bit closer. Um, and the black of agar jelly is shown in diagram A. After two hours, the agar jelly was placed on the cut surface of the original uh, coleoptile as shown in diagram B. So here it is. Okay, so let's just recap. They cut the tip off, as we can see it here. They put the tip on the agar block. They left that for two hours. They then took the agar jelly block. They placed it on the original stem that we cut it off. Okay. And then finally, the coleoptile was covered with a black box and it was allowed to grow for two days as shown in diagram C. So we let it grow. Now, let's bring your attention to what the diagram is showing us. After we put the agar jelly on top of the cut off shoot, you will notice that once we put it in the box, it still um, started to bend over, as you can see here in light, right? Do you also notice that they put it not in the center? And that's really important, everybody. I'm going to get really close so you can see that. Do you see they didn't put it in the center? 
That's not an accident in, in the finals. Don't ever think, oh, did they do that by accident? No, that's on purpose, everybody. Everything is on purpose in the final exam. Nothing, nothing is accidental. So it's off to the side, which means this side here is getting no agar jelly. Okay, that's important. Because now I know you're looking at this going, but ma'am, they put the uh, coleoptile back into a box, but there's no light. So why is it bending? Ah, well, let's explain that before we do the questions. Because of the properties of agar jelly, agar jelly acts like a membrane and allows for diffusion. So what has happened? All of the auxins that were in the tip, which is where auxins are made, diffused into the jelly block. The jelly block was then placed back onto the original shoot, but just off the edge, hey? Which means there's a high concentration on this side and a low concentration on that side. And what have we learned about that for phototropism? Well, if the high concentration occurs on the dark side of the stem, it bends. Now, there's no light in this experiment. However, we have artificially moved all of the auxins to the one side. Don't worry about the dark side. We've just artificially moved them to the one side. And now what you end up having is there's lots of cell elongation happening here on this side, whereas all of these cells are not elongating because there's no auxin on that side. And so the stem bends over. All right. So now that we have a bit of understanding of what's going on in this picture, now let's have a look at the questions and perhaps we've already answered some of them if we go over it. So the first question says, explain why the tip of the coleoptile was placed on the agar jelly for two hours at the start of the investigation for two marks. Again, what do we do? We do a statement and we do a reason. So statement, auxins are made in the apical bud or the apical tip. The tip of the plant. Reasoning then. Auxins diffuse into agar. And that's it. That's the only thing that you need to explain. Okay? <clears throat> For number two, it says describe what occurred in diagram C to cause the coleoptile to bend even though there was no light present? Do you see there is for four marks, right? So you've got to say four things. Remember, let's keep your, your head focused. What are the four things we normally focus on? How it happens, where it happens, when it happens, why it happens, okay? So as I explained to you earlier, you need to now describe what has happened. So the first thing you need to mention, if I go over to the next page so you can see me write it out, <clears throat> is the auxins are in a high concentration on the one side only. We are not going to say the dark side because there is no dark side, okay? Remember, they're in a dark box. But because the agar, remember, is sitting off to the side unevenly like that, so they're quite sneaky in the finals. Don't underestimate the things they can hide in pictures, okay? So just look out for those kinds of things. The auxins are high on concentration on the one side only. Then what we need to talk about is the fact that auxins diffuse into the, how do we spell this? Copy up down. Okay. Causing the cells to elongate on the side oh, side of the agar where as the cells on the opposite side 
do not elongate. And therefore, always round this off. It bends, right? But we're not going to say it bends towards the light, right? Because there's no light in the box. So we're just going to say it bends. Now, let's use my little premise of the how, when, where, and why. So I've got my four points here. Let's start off with the first one. So this is going to be auxins are in a high concentration on the one side only. So this is like where it is. Auxins diffuse into the coleoptal. This is how. The next two are actually whys. So why is it bending? And um, ultimately, the bend at the end is the product, right? So we're telling us why this happens. Um, you could also say when this happens but in this particular one if you actually think about it um there is no when because we're not applying light to it if there was light then you could say when light is applied it will bend towards the light but of course we're not saying that right so there's no way we could actually use that and that's how we would get four out of four okay let's just go back here Right, last question for this one before we move on. Describe a control for this investigation. So this is important for why we highlighted the introductory sentence. Um, so in the beginning here, I made you highlight it because it tells us the independent and dependent variables. So this is the independent variable, the effect of auxins, and growth is the dependent variable. If I want to make a control, I must remove the independent variable. Therefore, I must remove the auxin. So what is my control for this experiment? Describe it. It's only for two marks. Um, my control for this experiment would be to cut the tip off like this and leave it as is. In other words, leave the uh, tip off completely. So not, not use an agar block, not use, uh, not put the tip back on nothing, just cut it off like this and then put it in a black box. So step one, one mark, cut off the tip or the apical bud, place in a black box. The alternate, everybody, is to not cut the tip off the box. Uh, sorry, not cut the tip or the apical bud off of the shoot and then place it into a box. Why does that one also work? Well, um, essentially what we're testing for here is you're not actually testing for auxin's sensitivity to light. I hope you know that. That's not what we're testing for here. We are testing for the effect auxins have on growth. So if you take away the auxins, we'll be able to see whether or not our experiment was successful. You could also just leave the auxins in there and see what happens. But I wouldn't really go that way i wouldn't go for that as my main first answer i would go with cutting the tip off or cutting the apical bud off placing it in a dark box and observing it and that would be the control because we remove the independent variables so that's why it's important to highlight that at the beginning okay i'm gonna have a look at a question or two if there's any in the chat uh signita wants to know is there different types of ear receptors and where each receptor works in um for that it's quite simple i'm going to tell you an easy way before i go on to the next one so the question is how do you tell the difference between the receptors in the ear so first of all there are three receptors in the ear there's the hearing receptor actually i'm going to write all that out each time there is hearing receptor which is what? The organ of corti. Um, and then you have your posture and your balance. Oops. And the po posture one is linked to the sacculus and utricolus 
And the balance one is going to be your semicircular canals. Now, those are just the structures. Hey, I haven't given you uh, the receptor yet. So those are the structures that hold in these. And um, the semicircular canal is the one that has the cristae. And the utriculus and saculus is the one that has, I think if I remember correctly, the maculae. And that's it. That's all you need to know. That's the receptors. So let me just highlight the names. So this is the receptor, this is the receptor, this is the receptor, and then this is just the location. I suppose the organ of corti location, if I wrote it above here, would be the cochlea. So the cochlea has the organ of corti, the utricle and saculus have the maculae, and the semicircular canals have the cristae. And that's it. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question because I want to finish these last few. Um, Ma'am, how do we differentiate between geotropism and phototropism in diagrams? That's a good question. Um, I'll quickly answer it. Generally, if it's in a box, it's like a clinostat. If it's in a box like that, it's going to be phototropism, everybody. Um, if it is a radical on a Petri dish, a radical means, everybody, a seed with the root growing out of it, like that. It's probably going to be geotropism. Um, or if the plant has been turned sideways. In other words, that's the pot plant like this. And this is the clinostat. Like that's the clinostat, there's the pot plant it's rotating sideways. That's geotropism. Um, but I just want to remind everybody, because I feel like you're all focusing on that a lot, and what it tells me is the following. If you are so worried about them asking about geotropism or phototropism, I want to remind you that auxins do other things. And that's really important, everybody. You, you can't go into the exam thinking it's only responsible for photo and geotropism. Because it concerns me, because it means you don't actually understand what auxins do. Auxins create apical dominance and they create growth. And the point of this experiment was not to test tropisms. It was to test growth. So it's very concerning if we don't actually know the three functions of auxins. Apical dominance, if you don't know what that means, I'll tell it to you now. Apical dominance means the following. It means if we grow a tree, the narrow part is at the top, the wider part is at the bottom of the tree. This is apical dominance. Apical dominance means lateral branches don't grow. You only get lots of lateral branches lower down. But as you go up, they get fewer and fewer. So that's what apical dominance is. I'm very, very concerned, grade 12s, if you don't know those three functions. Um, because they're, they can ask you anything about auxins. Okay. Um, let me have a look at another question. Hi, ma'am. I lost a mark when describing a genesis in a past paper because I mentioned the second meiotic division only occurs after fertilization. Should we not mention that? Yeah, uh, Chanel, you don't need to mention that, hey? Um, it's not necessary. You don't need to know that. You don't need to. You're not wrong, by the way. Um, it, <clears throat> the, the second division of meiosis does occur afterwards. Um, but I wouldn't. Um, you don't need to know, just so you also know this, everybody, you don't need to know eugenesis and spermatogenesis in incredible detail. You just need to know that in males, it happens from puberty onwards, and you make four sperm cells from every one diploid cell, follicle cell. In females, you start the process of a genesis when the girl is a embryo and she produces one ovum and three polar bodies and that's really all you need to know that's all I would actually focus on I wouldn't spend any more time other than that okay all right uh, another question Sazi miss do the examiners also ask about the other plant hormones and by other I mean besides acetic acid gibberellians not sure how you spell it yeah 
Yes, they do. So um, for those of you who have, haven't have watched one of my videos on answering an exam question, I'm going to tell you which one to go to. You're going to go into my playlist. Actually, I can show you. Let me go into my YouTube. I have it open here. You can go into my playlist. I'm going to show it to you now. Uh, where did I put it? I put it in... Where did I put it? Let's go into my videos because then I can find it easy. I'm going to show you which one you're going to go and watch. You are going to go back and you are going to watch... Let's see. Where is it now? I'm going to find it. Let's see. I've got to go slowly because then I feel like I'm going past it. Have I done it that long ago? I must have. Okay, I'm going to go all the way back because I must have done it a very long time ago. That's why maybe you guys don't see it straight away. I'm going to find it. These aren't all my videos though. Let's go home. Oh, there it is. This one. It's a members only video. Okay, this guy right here. Please go and watch it. If you want to know how to answer another question on another hormone, this one is on abscisic acid, which I don't think you've ever potentially ever done a question on abscisic acid. This one is golden, everybody. So just have a look. It's in your members only section. This one um, is a great way to practice plant hormones. You can see I even said it's hard. It is, everybody, it is. It doesn't get harder than this. If you can do this question without looking at the memo and you get the same full marks, then you are ready. You'll also see I put another plant hormone uh, exam question that's hard. Again, you can find this in your members only section. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Let's go back into the questions, okay? Because um, I want to do these next two questions and then see if there's anything else you guys want to ask me before I go. Okay, <clears throat> question 3.3, an investigation was conducted, remember to highlight, to determine the effect of the different months of thyroxine on the metab metabolic rate. So the procedure was as follows. We had nine healthy adult male rats. They were divided into three groups, A, B, C. All three groups were kept in the same environment in three separate cages. Each group received the same amount of water. Each group was given a different diet. Their initial mass was taken. Three weeks later, their mass was taken again. Their oxygen consumption was also measured. Diet X was food containing all the essential nutrients. Diet Y was food containing all the essential nutrients and an extra bit of thyroxine. And diet Z is food containing all the essentials and a chemical that inhibits thyroxine. Okay, stops the production. Now we have a table for this investigation. So we have ABC, diet, with a, as I just like to point this out, there's an unknown variable here. And then we have their initial masses, their masses after three weeks, and then their average oxygen consumption. So before we go into the questions, you always need to just interpret the table. Like don't, don't read, you know, like, too much into this. And what I mean by that is don't um, read it and then move on. That's what I mean. So an important little note is just hiding at the bottom here. Note, group A was given diet X, which is this guy over here. So this is the one I highlighted earlier, that guy over there. So this group over here is actually the control. And I know that because we're not actually changing anything about them. We're just giving them regular nutrients but we don't know what b got and we don't know what c got now the only way you can answer this question is if you know what thyroxine does and if you don't know what thyroxine does then you won't be able to answer this question good luck it's going to be tough if this is not an easy question i chose this question because it's really hard you're going to struggle remember that thyroxine is produced by the thyroid and it is responsible for your metabolism and how fast you respire because remember metabolism is all the chemical processes in your body and one of those chemical processes is respiration cellular respiration which is why they measured the oxygen consumption because when you respire more you use more oxygen okay so let's have a look here if we interpret this we see that they roughly started on the same but not perfect and we'll see that uh, in group B, they actually lost weight. So these guys lost weight. And these guys gained weight. Now let's have a look at what their possible diets could be. We don't know which one, right? Remember that. We don't know which one's Y and which one's Z. 
if you give <clears throat> a rat all the nutrients it needs and you give extra thyroxin, what is the purpose of thyroxin? To increase the metabolism. If you increase a rat's metabolism, what's going to happen? They're going to respire more, but they are going to lose weight. Okay? Because if you respire more and your metabolism is faster, you are not going to gain weight. You're going to lose weight. On the other hand, so it's safe to say that this is going to be diet Y. On the other hand, our diet Z, right? This individual over here gained weight. Now, that's because this group got a chemical that inhibited the effects of thyroxine, which means they ate a regular diet, but their metabolism was inhibited, which means that they actually gained weight. This is the gaining group, which means they also respire slower. That's how it works, everybody. That's also why you lose body fat, just so that you know that. You lose body fat because you respire more. Why do you respire more? Because you have more mitochondria in your muscles, when your muscles are growing and when you're exercising. So you burn more fat, you burn more kilojoules or calories, and your metabolism works faster, so you actually lose weight. That's how that works. And how do you do that? With thyroxin. Thyroxin increases, right? So let's have a look at the question. Name the groups A, B, or C in which the average mass of the rats increased. So let's have a look here. Um, in group A, they definitely increased. And in group B, no. And in group C. So this is for two marks. Our answer over here is definitely going to be group A and group C. Right? Now for this investigation, state the independent variable and then the dependent variable and, and how it was measured. So where, do we, where are we going to get the independent variable? Well, we go back up to the top here. To determine the effect of different amounts of thyroxine, that there is the independent variable and metabolic rate. Is so, <clears throat> how are we going to figure this out? We're going to put here um, different amounts of thyroxine, right? So, this is amounts of thyroxine, right? And then the dependent variable is the metabolic rate. I'm just going to put your MR for metabolic rate. How did we measure it? We measured it, everybody, via the average oxygen consumption. That's how you tell someone's metabolic rate is going up. So we're going to measure it with the oxygen, right? Two marks. Done. Okay, moving on. Next question. Arrange the diets X, Y, and Z in order of increasing amounts of thyroxin that will be found in the rats after they were given these diets. So, in other words, from increasing from lowest to highest. So, who has the lowest? The lowest level of thyroxin is going to be C, because look how low their respiration rate is, followed by A. And then by B. B is the fastest respirer. Okay. And so how did I then equate that? Oh, wait. I've made a mistake. I beg your pardon. I didn't read the question properly. Look, I've made a mistake because I didn't read it properly. It says arrange the diets for X, Y, and Z in order. Oh, the diets. That's a Z as well, by the way. In order of increasing amounts of thyroxine that would be found in the rats as they were given these diets. So who has the least amount of thyroxine? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's going to still, sorry, that's still correct. So diet C will have the least thyroxine, followed by diet A and then diet B. Yes, all right. I know it was right. It was right. It was right. Sorry, I was, I was misreading it. It is. It's the increasing amounts of thyroxine. That's correct. And it makes sense. Why, everybody? Because if you look at the table, you look at these values over here, the more thyroxine you have, the faster your metabolism. And that's that's how it goes. Okay. Right. Which group, B or C, was given diet Y? Well, we've established that it's going to be group B. Refer to the changes. Let's highlight this. Refer to the changes in the mass and oxygen consumption of the rats in the table above to explain your answer. So do you see how it's for five marks? 
Okay, it's a big one, guys. This is why I said it was a harder question because of all your reasons and stuff. But now what you have to do is um, your reasons are linked to the mass and the oxygen consumption, right? So those are actually your reasons. So why did I pick B? I picked B statement. Let me just put a page here. Statement. I picked B as our answer if I go back to it I picked uh, diet is it diet B oh yeah group B I beg your pardon group B I picked group B mm, sorry I'm reading the information I picked I picked group B because this is the group that thyroxin was given to now all my reasons thyroxin increases metabolism next reason and because it increases metabolism it increases respiration now don't just say respiration on its own everybody Please make sure that you actually use the value in the table because it's asking you to actually use the changes. So it, its oxygen consumption was 10. Was it 10 ml kg minutes? So 10. So it uses 10 mils of oxygen per kilogram per minute. Okay. Another reason. Uh, it decreases the mass of the mouse. And we're going to go and see what it was. It went from 320 to 309. So you actually must say that. 320 to 309. And then our final reason is because... Um, Thyroxin causes more glucose to be used during uh, respiration. Oh, let's not say respiration. Let's say cellular respiration. And that's what gets you your five out of five. Okay. I got my four reasons with my statement so thyroxin were so statement the that the thyroxin was given to them so they were given extra thyroxin thyroxin increases the metabolism by increasing the respiration by this much by decreasing the mass of the mouse by this much and finally thyroxin causes more glucose to be used during cellular respiration that's why you lose body fat or body weight as a mouse and a human too okay that's why I would say that this is a hard, difficult question. I did see some comments. I'm just going to look at the chat quickly. Um, there's a whole bunch here that I need to go over. Uh, Singita says, ma'am, what's the difference between ADH and aldosterone? It trends to trick me. ADH is for water. Aldosterone is for salt. But they work together for osmoregulation or maintaining water. Um, Hamid, what do they ask about the pregnancy and gestation period or do we need to learn that? No, you don't need to know uh, like the length of pregnancy or anything like that. You just need to know up until implantation. So once it is an embryo and it's grown the placenta and the chorionic villi, that's all you need to know. And you don't need to know any further than that. Nothing about the trimesters, nothing. Um, Sinita, ma'am, a question mentioned in, in Oh, about a question you mentioned in paper one prediction on why does a diet patient have too much thirst? Oh, um, I mentioned that because if you look at your textbook, it will probably tell you the symptoms of someone with diabetes. Uh, they ha they're thirsty all the time. The reason why they are thirsty is diabetics have too much glucose in their blood. And if you have too much glucose in your blood, osmolarity is increased, which means there is more solutes in the blood. And what do we what have we learned about that? Well, if your blood is more sugary or salty, 
um, it causes you to be thirsty because it means that you don't have enough blood in, uh, sorry, enough water in your blood and it makes you want to drink water. So maybe the question in the final paper might be something like, how do you correct this? So how does a diabetic body try and correct this? And it's going to be linked to ADH. Okay. And what, which explanation are you going to give? You're going to give ADH on a hot day. So it is in the guideline, uh, sorry, it is in my study guide, which one to use, hot and cold. If they talk about diabetics and having thirst and how would we correct this using the knowledge we have about hormones, you're going to talk about ADH on a hot day. Okay. Right. Let's have a look at some of the questions. Uh, wonderful wise, ma'am. When thyroxin increases, does TSH decrease? Uh, yeah, thyroid goes down. Yeah, they have negative feedback on each other. Sazi, uh, when you erased respiration and put cellular respiration instead, our examiner is going to deduct marks if you're not specific. Um, yes, please write cellular respiration and not respiration, everybody. Uh, respiration uh, often refers to breathing, whereas cellular respiration refers to the mitochondria and the metabolism. So that's why we want to use the word cellular respiration. Okay, right. Final little question at the bottom here. I'm going to do this before I do the very, very, very last question because we've been on here for quite some time and I know it's a long time to take you away from your studying. Wonderful wise, what is the difference between thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroxin? Wonderful wise, it's a very good and important question. You should know this at this point, but um, number one, you can find it in my study guide. But basically the difference is uh, TSH is or thyroid stimulating hormone is the hormone that comes out of the pituitary gland that is sent to the thyroid. And the thyroid under the influence of TSH produces thyroxin. So TSH is a stimulating hormone, just like FSH is a stimulating hormone. And it stimulates the thyroid to make thyroxin. Okay. Um, Hamid, I can't do that right now. I must finish this question. Otherwise, we're not going to get through to the last question. Number six, state three ways in which validity of this investigation could be increased. I always feel like we don't know what validity is. Those are the variables, guys. That's all the things that we must keep the same. So same time, same place, same amount, same, same. But I just want you to notice it said could be increased. So that means if you go back up to this paragraph, you're not allowed to mention any of these. You're not going to say same number of males. You're not going to say same sex of males. You're not going to say same amount of water. You are not going to say the same um, time of three weeks. They don't want to know what you did keep the same. They want to know what could you have. So three other ones. So first things first, I'll tell you what I would have given they don't mention that the uh, rats are the same age. They just say adults. But what does adult mean, right? What does it mean? We don't actually have a definition. So I would have given same age. They never mentioned whether or not the rats had any diseases. So I would say no, uh, no, no uh, pre- existing diseases so they in other words everybody they all start off with the same initial health so they're all initially healthy it doesn't actually say that does it let's have a look here uh, it doesn't actually say they were all healthy if you reread here it doesn't mention anywhere that they were all healthy and then i would say it also doesn't mention their activity levels because your respiration rate is linked to the activity. So I'm going to say here, same activity levels. There's so many actually that you could list, to be honest. But I'm just giving the three off the top of my head. Okay, that is validity. Variables. Just to remind you, reliability is different. Reliability is those answers where you say, you know, like increase the sample size. Calculate an average or uh, what is it? Increase or repeat. Those are the re uh, reliability answers that you give. 
those are the fixed three whereas these are like numerous these are dependent on what you're doing okay last question and maybe i'll be able to answer some of these this is probably the one you've been waiting for most out of all of them this is the female reproductive system with hormones let's get into it this is the kind of application question we should expect to see now on friday so contraceptives are used to prevent pregnancy some females use pills that contain progesterone in one packet there will be 28 pills of which 27 uh, contain progesterone uh, contain sorry different concentrations of progesterone um, and the remaining seven will contain no progesterone a female has to take one pill daily at the same time in a given sequence as shown below so they're like that okay the graph below shows the difference in progesterone levels during a menstrual cycle of a woman taking contraceptive pills and a woman not taking those contraceptive pills. Okay, don't worry everybody, I see your questions, I will get to them, don't worry. 241, <clears throat> oh, actually before we do that, I beg your pardon, let's go through the graph very quickly. So we've got a person with pills, so you can see her progesterone levels go up, they plateau, and then they drop off which probably means the first seven pills have increasing amounts of progesterone, um, roughly, because if we look at, if we like, this is roughly seven, so the first seven days, then the next uh, 14 days, we have equal amounts, so that's 14, so we've got increasing amount of progesterone, same amount of progesterone in the pills, and then no progesterone in the pills, or decreasing amount. Then we have another female who's not taking pills. And as you can see, she has low progesterone levels throughout until around day 14 where it goes up and then it drops off over time and goes down. Okay, hopefully we can see that the pink one is more familiar to us because this is what it naturally follows. And you're essentially looking at a hormone graph that you may have seen before. Um, the only difference is we're missing the ovulation line, which you're probably really familiar with. That would run down there. And then that's progesterone peaking after ovulation. So you're actually familiar with this. So don't get too thrown off of it like you don't know. You've never seen it before. Okay. Number one, the estrogen levels between, and this is important. We're talking about estrogen now. Levels between day 8 and 22 will remain low in the woman who takes contraceptive pills. Explain why this is the case for four marks. So estrogen levels between day 8 and day 22 will remain low in a woman who takes contraceptive pills why is this the case so this is a hard oh sorry i'm bumping my camera this is a hard question everybody even i need to take time to make sure i'm going to answer this properly it's a hard question because it's four marks for an explain which again is going to be statements and reasons right So first things first, statement, you're going to tell me what estrogen does. But in this case, we're going to say estrogen levels are low because of negative feedback. Reason. Now, if you didn't know this, estrogen and progesterone do have an impact on one another in that progesterone is what? The pregnancy hormone. So if progesterone, I feel like I've spelled progesterone wrong. I feel like we've been doing this lesson for so long now. I can't remember how to spell progesterone. Oh, it's with a G. Silly me. Progesterone. So when progesterone is high, estrogen is low. Why is that? Because progesterone, and this is my next reason, is responsible for pregnancy or actually more specifically maintaining pregnancy. Okay. Estrogen is low. Why is it low? This is my other reason. Because we don't want a new 
follicle to develop. And because there is no new follicle developing, no follicle equals low estrogen. And uh, that's, that's our answer. Um, and it's quite a difficult one to answer. I'm not going to lie to you. That's probably the hardest question that you could potentially get. Is out of four. I think I actually gave five things. Um, probably what I could have done is I could have made this my statement. Oops. I could have made uh, this my statement over here. So, ugh, not this one. I could have made this one here my statement. There like that. So progesterone is high, estrogen is low. When progesterone is high, it's there for maintaining pregnancy, low, blah, 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 blah. And that would have given me my four. Okay. Right. Second last question. Ovulation took place on the 14th day in the woman not taking the contraceptive pills. And I drew the line in of where we think uh, ovulation is going to be on day 14. Explain the evidence on the graph that supports this conclusion. Well, the evidence on the graph, everybody, is the peak of estrogen afterwards. So... Two marks. Again, explain. What do we do? Statement, reason. So, statement. Progesterone peaks after ovulation. Reason, to prepare for pregnancy. That's it. Just for two marks. Short one. Straightforward. Last one. Suggest one reason for including pills with no hormones in the contraceptive packet. Now, suggest literally means you can come up with your own answer. Isn't that pretty cool? It literally means that uh, they're actually very open to whatever you're going to suggest. So why do we include pills with no hormones in them in the contraceptive packet? You can come up with any reason. Um, probably it would be to... Um, I would say mimic a period is one. Because if there's no progesterone, everybody, then the progesterone falls off and your period starts. Another one is something like hmm, um, to show there's no pregnancy. That's not to say that you can't fall pregnant on the contraceptive tablet. But uh, if your period or your your sort of false period starts on the on the on the pill, and um, the likelihood is lower that you are pregnant, so it shows no pregnancy. It mimics your period, um, and maybe you could even say, hmm, allows for new. Endometrium to grow. But by the way, uh, you can say that, but they've actually proven now that you don't actually need a new endometrium to grow every month. Um, if you're on the if you're on the contraceptive pill, let me phrase that. You don't actually need it. Okay. So that is going to be our last question for today. But I'm going to have a look at your questions now and answer you quickly as best as I can. Starting off with uh, Muhammad, the negative feedback with female hormones. Muhammad, that is such a long explanation, and I'm going to give you some advice. You are going to go onto my YouTube, and you are going to watch under the grade 12 playlist. I'm going to show you which video now. You are going to go, and you are going to watch this one over here menstrual cycle. In this video, I very, very clearly describe the menstrual cycle from beginning to end with the negative feedback. Also, Muhammad, because you are a member, you should be using the study note I have provided in the study guide, and that will make your life so much easier. Okay, let's have a look at the other questions. Um, Sazi, is reliability basically how valid the experiment is? No, that's validity. Reliability is how reliable are your results. 
So ask yourself these questions. Are the results reliable because I, and let's go back to what I written down, unless I've rubbed it out. Yeah, I've rubbed them out. But are your results reliable because you repeated the experiment? Are your results reliable because you included a large sample size? And are your results reliable because you calculated an average? Validity of variables, same time, same place, same amount, same water, same environmental conditions, that's validity, okay? Another question from Zadi, could you also have said that estrogen levels are low because progesterone level has been increased? Yes, you could have said that too, Zadi, that if you increase your progesterone levels, you then uh, decrease the amount of estrogen, that's fine. For the last question, could you say so that the body gets used to taking the pills every day at the same time? No, it's not a good enough answer. Uh, unfortunately, that won't get you any um, marks for that. Uh, let's see. Marina, thank you for this live, Miss Angler. So pleasure. If you just joined me, by the way, it is going to go up now and I'm going to put it into chapters so you can fast forward to the sections you want to watch. Ms. Angler, can you explain the last question again? I'm assuming you're talking about this one over here. Suggest one reason for including the pills with no hormones in the contraceptive packet. So if you don't know, in pill packets, this section over here has no progesterone in them. Often they're just actually sugar tablets. And when you don't have any hormone in the packet, uh, or in the tablet, should I say, in these tablets... What happens is progesterone levels, as we can see in the graph, sorry, as we can see in the graph, drop off. And when the progesterone levels drop off, then you, um, then it leads to a menstruation. And that is because why? You need to know what progesterone does. Progesterone maintains the endometrium lining and makes it more vascular and glandular. And if the progesterone levels drop off because you're taking tablets with no progesterone in them, right? It means that the lining, the endometrium, will fall away because it's no longer being maintained and it's no longer vascular and glandular. Okay, that's why I came to that reasoning for these three down here. So um, it mimics a period in that if you're not taking any progesterone, you will have a period. If you are not taking any progesterone tablets and your period comes, it also shows you there is no pregnancy because if there was a pregnancy, then you wouldn't have any menstruation. It means that the placenta and the corpus luteum would take over for your tablet, like if you fell pregnant on the, uh, on the contraceptive tablet. And then last one here, that's just a, a, an extra one. Um, it allows a new endometrium layer to grow. It's just simply because if you want to grow a new lining the next month that's basically it it's not it's, there's nothing really like specific i would rather go for these first two here as my choices okay now um members i also just want to say to all of you before i end this live um is that you can ask me questions and i'm going to reply to you on our comment section so please do that if you have any questions before friday and lastly i'm going to be doing a tiktok live revision lesson on thursday afternoon you can go over to my tiktok page and find out what time it's going to be that's going to be for everybody it's just to answer everybody's questions and anything that they want to know last minute before the exam where do we find the study pack, Sinead? The study pack is, um, if you go onto your membership perks page, it says see perks info. You click on see perks info, you scroll all the way down to the Google Drive, you click that, it will send me a message to say Sinead wants to look into, she wants access and I then give you access and that's where you can find the study guide. Um, Sunita, Sunita, the difference between Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. Again, Sunita, that is in the study guide. I'm pretty sure I have included that. Um, and, but the main difference is the causes. So one is a lack of myelin sheath. The other one is a buildup of plaque. You need to go and figure out which one that is from the study guide. Um, it's very, very easy. I've made it simple for you to find it. But if you can't, um essentially the main differences between the two are one has no myelin sheath the other has plaque buildup um uh, it's called amyloid plaque buildup um, and i want you to go and find those two things it's if it should also actually be in your exam guideline as well and it is probably in your textbook as well 
where to find it. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody now. Um, look out for my TikTok live if you want to do another revision just before, the day before on Thursday. And I will see you all again soon. Bye!